Welcome to this week's edition of Outdoors Online, a weekly webcast produced by the North Dakota Game and Fish Department. I'm your host, Tom Jensen. My guest this week is Andy Dingus. Andy is a waterfall biologist with Game and Fish. Andy, you and your crews are finishing up your winter waterfall surveys. Pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, that's right, Tom. Um, you know, our surveys always start the first week of January every year. Uh, this year it kind of fell on the January 2nd through the 6th of the, of the month. So, um, you know, this year it was a pretty severe winter. We had one observer up in a plane, um, you know, basically covering the Missouri River, open waters of the Missouri River that uh, weren't frozen. So, um, you know, another part of the survey is we kind of send out just some uh, field data sheets, other, other people in the state, district, state, district offices, as well as uh, offices for the Fish and Wildlife Service. So that just kind of, usually we get a lot of uh, zeros with that data, but just kind of allows us to keep track of what might be going on um, in the state as far as changes and wintering, wintering uh, areas, so. Why do you do these in the dead of winter? Well, it's really, you know, it's a, it's a nationwide survey. So, you know, every state in the United States is involved in this and it really just allows us to index populations of birds and um, for some species it's not as important. I mean we're tracking uh, breeding populations for dabbling ducks pretty every year you know annually in breeding areas but some some uh, species for instance uh, like tundra swans um, they nest really high in the Arctic you know so the the cost and logistics of doing those surveys annually are, are really difficult so it's really the only time we get to index some of these populations, such as tundra swans. Yeah, obviously um, that's during the winter. Mean. So, yeah, and we'll tie all that information into our harvest plans. That's for what those you use the data for is for for. That's right. Yep. For a harvest and for uh, setting season limits and things like that, or, yep. or just to see what's hanging around. Well, a little bit of both. Like for the tundra swans, yep, we'll use that information for setting seasons. For other species, you know, we'll use breeding information through those surveys, but it also just, it's a good snapshot uh, to, for biologists to get out, you know, on an annual basis and kind of see what's going on out there because there's there's a lot of changes. Waterfowl are really adaptive to resources. Um, one instance, um, white-fronted geese, you know, in the last decade, they've really changed their wintering area from like the coastal area of Texas into the Mississippi Alluvial Valley, mm -hmm. into northeastern Louisiana and eastern Arkansas. You know, without this survey, we probably wouldn't have catch, caught on to that as soon, so. Um, I'd guess the ducks and geese, at least in North Dakota, probably South Dakota, are pretty restricted on where they can hang out this time of year. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I the mean, water's pretty hard to find. Absolutely. Um, you know, our, our survey in North Dakota is pretty simple. We don't typically have a lot of open water. Um, this year, you know, most of our birds were on the Missouri River, north of Bismarck, all the way up to the tail race of Sakakawea. So usually that's pretty typical uh, for the winters in North Dakota. Um, just for instance, last year though, we did have two observers flying because Lake Sakakawea, or at least the lower end of the lake was, uh, was open, so. And we had lots of waterfall last year. This year now has been a completely different story. It seems like we've had blizzards, if not every weekend, at least every other weekend and things. There isn't much open water. What are you finding? Yeah, so, you know, we got initial numbers in already for the survey this year. Um, you know, we certainly we counted a lot less waterfall out there than we did last year. We uh, roughly, we counted about 25,000 Canada geese and 3,000 mallards in the state is all. Um, you know, just to give you kind of a comparison, last year we counted a record number, about a quarter million Canada geese. In and a about mild winter. In a mild winter and about 25,000 mallards. Um, just, you know, kind of to give you a 10 year average, 2005 to 2017 or so, for Canada geese, we winter about 90,000 birds, for mallards about 25,000. So. Those numbers, you know, just like our winters, fluctuate pretty drastically, but those are kind of some comparison numbers for you, um, so. Yeah, they've got to have open water, of course, but they also need food. And that um, kind of brings to mind that um, the cold really doesn't make as much different as, uh, as snow depths. If it covers up that, uh, the grain fields and things like that, they're gonna move. 
Yeah, um, you know, the waterfowl that we winter, primarily Canada geese and mallards, have great adaptations for cold weather. Um, and they've been highly adaptable to, you know, agriculture resources on the landscape. So, um, you know, once those food resources get covered up, you know, they got a lot harder time, to, you know, to meet those energy requirements they need for the winter. So, yeah, absolutely, that snow depth is probably more important than just overall temperatures in the winter. So, Believe it or not, we do have a waterfowl season that's going to be opening up here in the next month or so. The spring snow goose conservation season. That's not saying we're going to have snow geese in the state in the middle of February, no. but um, it's an interesting concept. Tell me uh, why we have the season, season dates, and, uh, and things like that. Yeah, the, the season was implemented basically just to reduce light goose uh, numbers, snow geese and Ross, Ross's geese, so, um, you know, they're, they're... Why do they need reducing? Yeah, I mean, ba essentially they're destroying their Arctic breeding habitat, so, and that habitat takes a long time to recover, and we really don't know how long, essentially, it might take to recover, you know, we're still kind of, kind of looking at some of that information, but really we're just, you know, they're, they're basically eating themselves out of their habitat in the, in the Arctic breeding areas, so we're trying to reduce their numbers overall with this conservation order season. Um, you know, and it, it occurs after all our waterfowl seasons are closed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this year it'll start February 18th. And like you said, Tom, um, you know, probably this year we <laughs> won't have any snow geese in the state, but we have the, the ability to, to open the season up um, as long as all our other seasons are closed. So that's why it's so long as we don't know when. The yeah, so we, we got the opportunity to have a wide window and sometimes that migration, spring migration of snow geese can occur on, you know, kind of a wide spectrum. So we want to be able to just cover, you know, all the possibilities we might have in that spring, spring uh, migration period. So that's why that's kind of set that way. and. You know, this year it's kind of shaping up. It looks like we probably won't have snow geese in February, but you know, last year we, we probably had some birds late February in the state that, you know, would have been an opportunity for hunters to harvest. So we want those opportunities if available. So. Right, the season's open through probably the middle of May. Yeah. I think, isn't um, it? So, so you're gonna to get an opportunity. First May is when it's gonna close, so. If we still have snow on the ground in the middle of May, <laughs> we're going to be in trouble. Yeah, but it possibility, you know, we could still have some snow geese on that tail end this year as well, so. Yeah. All right, Andy, thanks. Thank you, Tom. The 2017 legislature is now in session and there are bound to be a few outdoor bills involved. If you plan to follow the session and track bills pertaining to the outdoors, here's a very valuable tool. The legislative page on the Game & Fish website. It'll give you a reference number for each bill, a brief explanation of the bill and how it might affect outdoors men and women, and we'll also have links to contact your lawmaker in every legislative district in North Dakota. Log on to the Game & Fish website at gf.nd.gov. You'll find the legislative page under the seasonal shortcuts on the home page. For Andy Dingus and the rest of the staff here at North Dakota Game & Fish, thanks for joining us for Outdoors Online. We'll see you again next week.